the Lord is praying for His church that day. By the blood of the Lamb, I bring you greetings from my wife and our little children. And we are pleased to be part of the ministry. In the interest of time, because it is 6.30 now, I am sure, and someone has said that a mathematician is a man who speaks while the rest sleep. And I tell you bad news, I'm a mathematician by training, and I speak at a time when people have had enough, and they're at the tipping point of sitting in their cars and going back home and refresh themselves and get ready for tomorrow. But I know for sure that they can spare me a few more minutes and listen to the oracles of God and the word of God. And therefore, I will, <clears throat> without wasting your time, uh, how do you know that you have lived a successful life? My subject in a short while is, uh, I just wanted to give it a simple uh, title, A Life Worthy Living. A Life Worthy Living. Yesterday something happened in church. I go out preaching and sometimes you preach and you invite people and by the grace of God people come, 5-3. A preacher yesterday came to church, I attended say, Kampala Central Church, and he preached for a short while and he invited people who want to be baptized? In the midst of, it was Pathfinder, and he just said, anyone who wants to be baptized, and in the simplicity of the call, about eight people walked up. In fact, 13, thank you for the correction. And, and I sat in my seat and I said, God, you are amazing. You, do, you take simple things and make them so powerful. And what I, while I was sitting here, I, I, I was hearing things, and I was thinking, it's a movie. You know, in the last presentation, you hear someone say you can do something simple and the impact is great. In Kalamoja, I see someone who has given his life for the service of others and has left his comfort and he desires only one thing, that the name of Jesus be lifted high. And I say to myself, I'm challenged from the core because also my passion is to give glory to Jesus Christ. And so I am very grateful that this organization has a mission which was given to me to grow the kingdom of God through evangelism as far as it is possible. And I would like to take you to the Bible and uh, discuss my subject because we don't have enough time. The, the story of the Bible tells us that Jesus is walking with his disciples. They are coming from Judea because they have had an experience there. So they are taking a leave and they are going over to make sure they come out of the storm for a while before they come back. And so Jesus moves with his disciples, and we are told that as he came close to a town called Sika, he tells the disciples to go and find something to eat because they had walked for a while and they were hungry. So as they, they, they go out, Jesus sits by the well in John chapter 4, and he sits there, and I like Jesus because Jesus in all his movement, he has a purpose. What appears is a mistake and a chance for you. Jesus is not a chance. So when he tells the disciples to go, he's creating room for dialogue. So he says, go get food, go get food, come back. And, and they go and they are singing. They are even wondering. They say, this Jesus is hungry. Today he has asked us to go and get food. He's really, really hungry. And so they go and Jesus sits by the well. And lo and behold, the target comes. A woman comes. And he finds a figure sitting there and... Uh, you know, I like to imagine what Jesus was saying, doing, uh, because I like doing, maybe he began singing a simple song, you know, in praise. Mm -hmm. My father, I love you. Mm -hmm. And the woman comes closer and sees this figure sitting by the well and says, mm, this time of the day, there's somebody here. And then uh, she comes and she says, mm -hmm, sir. Uh, Jesus is seated. Then Jesus knows that she's about to say something. She say, Jesus says, give me some water. I'm thirsty. Now, that, that question is crazy. Don't you think so? He's sitting by the well and he knows for sure that well has water, isn't it? But then he's asking for water. So the woman presupposes that uh, this person speaking the way he's speaking is not from here. He must be a Jew. And so he says, you, the Jews, you are very crazy people. And Jesus says, oh, oh, okay, now I know you understand. Go call me your husbands, and you know the story. But that's not my interest. My interest is down there. And the disciples who went on the mission, their mission was to find food, right? They knew Jesus is dead hungry. They come back. 
and they say, Jesus, Jesus, <clears throat> master, master, we were blessed, we were lucky, we met a stall, we found food, now you can refresh yourself, here is food, and Jesus surprises them, he says, I'm not hungry. And, and they say, G let me read the text, come with me, you don't have your Bible, so I'm going to read here. I'm reading from John chapter 4, verse 20, uh, verse 30, oh, yeah. Verse 27, the Bible says, just then his disciples came back. They marveled first that he was talking with a woman, but no one said the thing. Mm -hmm. What do you seek? Or why are you talking to her? So the woman left her jar, water jar, and went away into town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and they were coming towards Jesus. Now the disciples, the Bible says, meanwhile, that's why I'm not going to use this Bible again now after reading this one. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples say to one another, Is, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. And then he adds, do you not say there are yet four months, then have, comes harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one, already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together for here the saying holds true one who sows and another reaps i sent you to reap that for which you did not labor others have labored and you are entered into their work may we pray our Heavenly Father, we are so blessed that you gave us the light in your word to enlighten us on precisely what is fitting in your sight and above all, that which prepares us for eternal life. For truly Paul says that the word helps us and gives us wisdom unto salvation. And we are here that we might also tap into that wisdom and be able to live lives that are worthy in your sight and not in our sight. That we seek in Jesus' name. Um, the most important statement in the Bible is found in the book of Genesis chapter 1. In the book of Genesis chapter 1, the writer of the, uh, the text there begins by saying, In the beginning, God created the heavens and, and the earth was without form and void, and the darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God, which we learned of, whom we learned of last week, was hovering upon the face of the water. Now, the most interesting thing is that you have fallen two lines. You can either believe that the earth is a created entity, or you can say it is here by chance, as the sciences propagate. But I'm, I think, I'm assuming that all of us who are sitting here believe that the earth was created by an agent whom we call God, right? So we believe that the earth is created, and if you believe that the earth is created, you must also go a step further and conclude that if the earth is created, then there is intention and there is purpose. And if you conclude that way, then you must move another step further and begin to also say, in an intentional and purposeful life or universe, then life in that universe must have meaning. And if life has meaning, then you must move a step further and know in the meaningful life, there is both responsibility and obligation. The question I ask myself in the beginning of this year is, do you know your purpose in the paradigm of creation? And I'm about to prove to you, I'm going to discuss two points, and when I'm finished, I'm done. The first purpose is, I want to demonstrate to you that each one of us has a purpose in life. Number two, that you must know the times in which you live if you want to live a successful life. Because your passion and intent depends to a great extent to the knowledge you know of the times in which you live. And walk with me to the book of Proverbs. I'm going to run through because of time, so I will 
you will follow me if you have the Bible. If you don't, you will go back and read. Proverbs chapter 20, uh, I think it's 19, verse 21. The Bible says there in Proverbs, I like that Proverbs because I meditate on it every day. The Bible says there are many plans in the mind of man. In other words, as you sit here, and as we contemplate here, there are many purposes and plans that go on in our minds and we continue to contemplate. You say, maybe this, maybe this, I go this way, or I do this, or I do... You have a lot of purpose, but the Bible adds another clause there. It says, but it is the purpose of the Lord that stands. In other words, what comes to my mind, I can do all sorts of things, 30 years of service, but if I do not know whether it's the purpose of God for my life, I mean... Meaningless lies. Because let me tell you, the scale of our judgment is not in our care. It is not you to judge whether you are successful or not. Your judgment of success depends on whether you have fulfilled the task and the duty upon which God created you to fulfill. So you can buy all the cars. Thank God he has blessed you. But I believe and I want to suggest this day that you need to take time and ask God precisely what is your purpose, you as a person, and what is that divine purpose that God has assigned to you. And, and, and you know, as you go to Proverbs 20 verse 5, not very far from Proverbs 19, 21, the author, the wise men, begin again to say another thing that disturbs me. Because they say, a purpose in a man's heart is like deep water. Now, I appear small, but I'm a bit old. Eh? They were, when we were growing up, we had wells. Eh? You know Nkoma, right? You would go and there are rocks. And then there is in the middle a space that you have to use to draw the water. And then you go, you get a bucket like the woman at the well. Eh? You get the bucket and then you must balance. Because if you don't have skill, you can go also and become water. So you must make sure that you balance, that you are able to draw it with skill and bring out this bucket with energy but also with precise skill. Because you can... <laughs> now the wise men in their days, they didn't have taps which you... Eh? And water. No. For them, they had wells, as it is in the Bible where we read. And so people would come and draw the water was deep. And so they are saying, for a man's purpose in his heart, as God has placed there, is like deep water. And only, and only, I say, a man of understanding has the capacity to draw it out. Number one, there are many plans, but there is only one purpose of God that stands. Number two, the problem we have is that the purpose of God in your life is as deep as water in a well. That you only need a tool which is called understanding to draw it out. And then Proverbs chapter 2 verse 6 says that it is the Lord who gives wisdom. And out of his mouth comes understanding. In other words, as Proverbs 1 7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. In other words, a man cannot begin to live until he has the wisdom of God and the understanding of God because it's through this understanding that a man is able to discern the purpose for which he was created and called into ministry. I like to say what Elder was saying and my previous pastor, Pastor, thank you for the ministry. I, I, what she was saying, there is what we call the general corporate purpose of the church. To preach the gospel, right? But each individual has also a part in the gig soul. He has a purpose to fulfill in the global and corporate purpose. And every man must find that purpose. Let me give you an example. There is a, there is a town called Joppa. You know that town? There lives a lady called Tabitha. You know that lady? Her name is translated Dorcas. Eh? And the Bible says she's dead. And before they bury, after washing her, someone hears news that, oh, Peter is in the neighborhood. So they say, why before we bury, why don't we call the man of God? And, and, and in verse 36 of chapter 9, the Bible says that Tabitha was full of good works and acts. I was under, you know, I do language, by the way, I did language. And, and, and you know, when you do language, a noun, a noun is made beautiful by an adjective, you know that. When I'm reading a text, I look at the noun, but I also want to know the adjective. Because the adjective tells you the quality of a noun. This lady had good works, which is a noun, of course, right? It is a descriptive noun. But then not only good works, she was full. 
she was not preaching on the pulpit. She knew her ministry. And immediately after that text, the Bible says the women came when Peter came and were crying. Mm, widows, look, they brought out tonics. And they said, look, she, she, she knitted this one for me. And this one is like, this one for me. And they are crying. And that was her ministry. And she did it without complaining. She knew it. And she said, I don't know how to preach, but I know how to make tonics. And she was full of, that was her purpose. And she did it very let me lead you through Jesus' life a little bit. Jesus <clears throat> is with Pilate. You know, I like Jesus. You know, when Jesus is engaging with people, he does not provide all his answers. He allows people to use their cognitive abilities to arrive at answers. Because he gave us brains and he wants us to use those brains. And so he's talking to Pilate and he's saying to Pilate, mm. Pilate comes and says, you, Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says to the Pilate, instead of saying yes or no, Jesus says, do you say that upon your own accord or someone told you about it? Then the pi pilot is disturbed and he said, am I the one who brought you here? They, these guys brought you here. Anyway, what have you done? Why do they hate you like that? And then Jesus discovers that uh -huh, his plot has uh, happened. So, so Jesus says, if my kingdom was of this world, you know, people would take up arms and come and defend me. So then the pilot says, so you are a king. And then Jesus moves away immediately because this man is here. Then he says in verse 37, John 18, he says, hmm, For this purpose, I was born. And for this purpose, I came into the world. And then I was interested in hearing what purpose that is that Jesus was born for and that Jesus came into the world for. And Jesus gives me the answer because he says in the clause that comes by, he says, to bear witness. To the truth. I pause. It seems to suggest that before Jesus even came, as Jesus walked, he knew his purpose, right? Because before Pilate, he articulates clearly his purpose. He says, I was born for a purpose, I came for a purpose, and I tell you, you are blessed because the purpose for which I came is to bear witness to the truth. And everyone who hears the truth or who loves the truth is he such that understands. And then Pilate then is moved to another level. He says, but now what is the truth? He's ready for evangelism. And then Jesus says, we will do that another time. Peter Mazira will come to explain. But let me tell you something. That the purpose of Jesus Christ was clear. When you read the book of John, it is there where the word that sent is used more with Jesus Christ. It is used over 30 times and more. And let me give you a few verses because of time. When you read John chapter 5 verse 36, Jesus says, my testimony is greater than that of John the Baptist. And people say, John, but you just said the, the other time that John the Baptist is the greatest of the prophets that, are, prophets that have been. He's even greater than Elijah, isn't he? And then you are saying your testimony is... Uh -huh, he says, relax. Then Jesus says again after that statement, he says, mm -hmm, for the works that I accomplish... Uh -huh, the very works that I do in your midst bear witness of the fact that I was sent from the Father. In other words, Jesus was saying, you look at my conduct and then you will know that you're looking at a man who knows his purpose and his purpose is to accomplish the works of God. He's not doing his own works. You go to the next chapter, chapter 6, verse 38. He says, I came down from heaven not to do my own, but the will of him who? In other words, Jesus says that my only purpose, my only mission, and I know it clearly, is to do the will of him who sent me. I have no other business. I, I, I felt that was enough, but then it was not enough. Then I went to John chapter 8, verse 29. And, and there Jesus shocked me, says, he who sent me is with me. He has not left me. And then, you know, those are good words, aren't they? But Jesus always does not stop there. He adds again a word. He says, <laughs> because, the, you know the reason why he has not left Jesus, eh? the one who sent. Do you know why he's with Jesus? Then he says, because <laughs> I do the things that are pleasing to him. In other words, as Jesus walks, he has also 
taught us a lesson that if you want to continue walking with God, you must make sure that the works you do and the purpose you live is not your purpose but his purpose. Because when you walk in his purpose and do these works he has commissioned you to do, then God abides with you and he stays with you. And then the Bible again, I like John, I was reading through a little bit. It's because of time. We would read. And, and then I went to John chapter 17. Jesus is giving a final speech and is telling the disciples, uh, and he's, you know, he's praying for them. And then he, he, he prays a prayer. In John chapter 17, verse 4, he says, I have glorified you on earth. Having accomplished the acts and the works that you gave me to accomplish. In other words, Jesus is saying, I have run the course of life. I have gone far and near for the cause that you gave me. I have not deviated from that cause. I have walked that path. Now, Father, glorify me as I was before I came. Mission accomplished. My question is, do you know your, your ministry, by the way? Because if you don't know every ministry that comes, you would engage in it. Let me tell you a reason why I think everyone has a contribution to life. I, I, was, I became an Adventist at Makere University. It was my second year. I came from a village. In my family, I was the first person to get a government scholarship to come to Makere. And uh, I, 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 so I, by the way, I'm thankful to Besige because that time he campaigned in 2001, they increased the scholarship and I, they said from, is it, was it 2000? <laughs> yes, I, I, no, I'm, I'm honestly talking about this because that time he said he's going to increase the intake and the government also said it is going to increase and it increased. Now, I am not sure whether it, if it had remained, I would still keep sneaking, but I know God wanted me to be there because there I would hear the message of salvation. And so God expanded, he used the politics to expand the list, and I'm sure I sneaked in by the grace of God. And therefore, while I'm there, I'm walking, I was doing Bachelor of Science, Physics, Mathematics, and Chemistry, and I was walking and I'm doing my thing. And, and, and then the, the crusade, the Muzida, Kampala Central, you know, began a crusade, but before they began, God had appeared to me, led me to the Adventist message uh, through dreams, through visions, and, and the book my uncle received from a friend who was a pilot, the Adventist Bible, this big one, with prophecies. Uh -huh. So through prayer, I was praying, I was a Pentecostal at the time. I had converted to Pentecostalism with fire because I knew God was calling me, but I didn't know where to go. And God was continuously leading me, so I was going for an overnight. And I used to study in my bedroom, and I put uh, my, this Bible on, on there, the, the good news. I had read through this King James, but thou, thou, I said, Jesus. These things are tough. So I left that Bible in the sitting room, and then I was using the good news, which was palatable to my simple English. You know I was a scientist. English, we don't do it. You, God help us. But, but you see, at that particular time, I was coming out and I was going for the honor at night. Then I looked at the watch and I said, it is still nine. And if I go now, I'll get tired easily when we are praying. So I need to go about 11. So I sat in the sitting room, but I had nothing to do. And God was preparing me from this, uh, for this explosive, uh, explosive message. You forgive me those who are this side. I'm trying to hide from uh, the effects here. But, but you see... Then I sit in the sitting, then I look and I say, but I have put on my shoes already. Going back to the bedroom to pick a good news Bible, why don't I read this one? And guess what? When I opened like this, I saw prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. Then I said, but we have never had someone in my church preach on it. Maybe this is the ministry God wants me to. So I say, I, I look there, thou, I said, uh -huh. so let me go to for overnight, then come back. So I went for the overnight, and I prayed that night. But that night, that morning, God wanted me to know about this thing. So I came back, and I, I, I opened the Bible. I said, now I'm going to read this. I was, by the way, I didn't have sleep. I read the entire thing of Daniel, this explanation. So while I was reading, I came to a portion which says that the Sabbath was changed. And someone quoted Martin Luther. Now, I had gone to my mother's place when I was still in campus, and I had just gotten this experience. And I picked up a book in our shelf. It did have covers. And when I opened like this, I came to a topic, Martin Luther. So I read a few things. I said, mm, maybe I'll come back and read that book. So I put it back in the shelf. And here I'm at, at my grandmother, and I'm reading about Martin Luther. I said to myself, I should go and pick that book to get the history. So I go and pick the book that very evening. I, you people are joking. When the fire of the Lord is in your heart, you don't have time. You, just, you cannot. You cannot. 
You cannot sleep when when God comes like a flood. You cannot. Yeah, and, and I rise and I take a taxi. I say to his grandmother, I'm coming back. And I go, I pick that book and I come back home and I begin reading that book. I later discover it's a great controversy. I read it from page to cover in one week. And the semester is about to open in Makerere. So I go back to Makerere full of fire. You people are joking. I was in a Pentecostal fellowship. And that morning I went and told the, the papa I have a, I will preach this semester. He said, you, you I praise the Lord. Uh-huh. He didn't know what was coming. This man. <laughs> and then I begin, then we come to the preaching. And, and I begin, you know, and the people begin to smile because for the first time I was approaching presentation in a scholarly way. I was rugged, I am still, but that time the spirit made sure that I'm scholarly. And I began slowly, and people were saying, oh, what has happened to this brother? He's feeding us, brother. He's feeding us, brother. Until the Lord bombarded them, and I told them, do you know the Sabbath is not this one? It is. The papa stood up. But then as he was about to tell me, sit down, I think the Holy Spirit caught him. He stayed standing until I finished the sermon. <laughs> now, this is not joking. This is real stuff. And when I finished, they expelled me from the fellowship. They called me an area. But I had preached the message. And God began on a journey until the crusade came. When Randy was preaching, because I had read those things, when he was speaking about the things, I was just saying, that is correct. <laughs> that is... Are you people, you... Anyway, time is gone. But let me drive my point home. But, but you see, my, my point is, my brothers and sisters, the Lord had given me an express call and he had said I'm going to be a preacher. But as you settle into the faith, you begin to realize that the faith, preaching, uh, being a pastor is not simple, right? And more so in Africa. Forty churches. Brethren will even put out your things and say, Pastor, we don't want you. The I, I said, Jesus, <laughs> this cannot be. So I finished my degree. I go to, my uncle had paid my school fees from senior three. I was the light of the family. <laughs> he got me a place of teaching in Budo, secondary, not the other one, this one. Mm. Then he said, from there you will go. But then I told him, no, I've just finished. I want to give God some service. I'm going for a crusade in Mbale. When I come back, we'll talk about those things. He got annoyed. He said, I'm not going to look for you any other opportunity. So I went to preach the gospel in the crusade, and then I came back, and then I went to uncle. Now, uncle, what were you saying? <laughs> My uncle said, it is finished. It's up to you now. I began, look he didn't know he was playing into the will of God. So he began, I began looking for a job. One time I saw an advert in Makerere, technician. I said, I can go to this uh, physics. I will begin slowly. <laughs> so I went to apply. Made all my things and then went to market and I met, came to the door and I noticed that people were complaining. There were many there and saying, this office is never closed. What has happened? What, where are these guys? Where are... And then I said, where are these guys also? <laughs> so my mind tells me, why don't you go to Pastor Kairanga's office at center because we had been with him in the crusade and talk about eh, the experience. So I go, I meet an elder there, and we begin to talk, why don't you, what are you planning to do? I say, well, I was taking an application up here. I want probably to try this. And he say, why don't you try teaching while you wait? I say, well, I'm, I'm not a teacher. He say, no, 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 we were even talking about how increasing our ratio of Adventist teachers in our schools. So while we were still talking, Mr. Mugumia comes from Bugema University, Bugema Second. And he's going to the union, maybe, for a meeting. And he passes by and says, hello, pastor. Hey. And the elder sees him and says, hey, by the way, Mr. Mugumia, you remember what we were talking about of uh, our teachers, you know? And Mr. Mugumia says, yeah, but we don't see them. If we have them, we'll take them on. We want them. So science. Then pastor stands up. Twit! I have an application here. It was for my wife. We were not yet married. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, 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 and then... The elder was sitting, I was sitting there, and the elder says, eh, I also have another one. Then he said, the tear, that thing already. Where are you taking it? Tear it. I said, tear it. Then tear it, then he moved this application. And then also this one. And that's how I end up in Bogem. Getting closer to the theology school. You know, God is awesome. Eh? I teach in Bogema for a few years. Time is gone, but relax with me. I, I teach Bogema for a few years. And then I get an idea. I'm right, I know God is saying, you must go into ministry. I say, God, you are joking. I begin to argue. If I become a good engineer, 
I have money. God, don't you see? Money. <laughs> and then pastors come and say, crusade, crusade, budget. Four million. I say, what is that? And, and it, oh, couldn't I have some? Powerful? Committed? Seriously? And, and, then, and I tell you, that's a good plan. Eh? And God, I think, was in heaven sitting and he smiled. You know, he's patient with us. He allows us to explore our options. So that when we finally realize that his option is the best, then we can appreciate his way. So I, I, I struggle. Then I say, no, let me go and do a master's in electrical engineering. I go to Makerere. I get the admission. While I'm going, God intervenes. He tells me, don't go. I said to God, God, you know, I'm going because I'm going to serve you better. I get the application. I apply for two masters in physics, a masters in electrical engineering. They give me both of them. I have to make a choice. I choose masters in electrical. And I come home smiling and my wife looks at me like this. You know, we, women have... Uh, she looks at me and then in the night, I'm, a, I'm praying and the Lord visits. This time he, did, he does not visit in a joking way. This time he's serious and because I'm going to make a choice, either I'm going to pay for electrical engineering or I'm taking his way. And he tells me, you see, it is not you who decides the, the rest. It is me who decides how you run. Yours is to comply with mine. You can do a good job, but I think I have called you to do this job. So I said to God, now, if that is the case, I'm going to go to Bugema. If they disturb me, you will not have tried. <laughs> Guess what? I went to Bugema to cut the long story short. It went through smoothly, 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 until, Jesus, until I discovered that I would never be happy until I do the will of the Lord. What I'm simply saying is that you could be pursuing something and it is good. But are you sure it's the will of God for your life? Because every man has a purpose. Every man, you know, there is someone who God said you shall be an engineer. And in through your profession you shall bless the ministry and the work. And that's your calling. There is another one who through medical understanding and medical knowledge will be able to make an impact like Ben Carson, isn't it? And shine the flag of the gospel as well in the medical field. What I'm simply saying, can you take time and know what the will of the Lord is for your life? But it will take wisdom and understanding. And, and as I close, the next phase is time. Time. Do you know the times in which you live? By the way, do you know that your passion depends to a great extent on the knowledge of your purpose, but also on the knowledge of the time in which you live? That's why in the text we read, Jesus highlighted two things. One, he said, I, my food is to do the will of the Father who sent me. In other words, he said, my purpose is this. But he also said, don't you say that it is always four months and the harvest time, but I want to tell you, look yonder, and it is already harvest. In Luke chapter 12, verse 54, Jesus rebukes the people. This is what he says. And the Bible says, and he also spoke to the crowds and said, when you see a cloud coming from the west, you conclude that it is going to be a shower. And in fact, Jesus says, at once it is. In other words, your conclusion is spot on. And then he says, but when you look in the south and you see the wind coming, you conclude that surely it's going to be a scorching heat. And then Jesus says, you are hypocrites because you have the capacity, the ability to discern the times and the signs, to know the things that pertain to the earth and to know the things that pertain to the sky. But you lack the capacity to know the times in which you live. And this is what I learned. That you can have all the academic prowess the world can give you, but that is not sufficient for you to know the times. Do you know why these people could not know the times? Because Jesus is simply saying, you know, to make a conclusion, you must have a description, right? Iteration. That's scientific mind. They look in the West, and then they have repeated occurrences, and then they say, ah, when you ever see a cloud coming from there, then you know it's going to. Those are scientific minds. 
And Jesus is saying, you people who have the capacity to take descriptive data and make inferences, you don't have the capacity to look at what is going on and make the right inference in the spiritual things. Why? Because of two reasons. Number one, that these people were more interested in things that pertain to agriculture because their interest was agriculture since they were agro-based economic people. That's why the inference is on rain, is on heat. The, I tell you, you cannot know the times and your purpose unless you develop an interest. What Jesus is simply saying, what you are interested in, you are willing to invest time in understanding the things about it. And unless you develop an interest in the things of God, you will not be able to receive the revelation required therein. The second point is, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. One thing I love as I end. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 12, the Bible says, Oh, rejoice, you heavens, <laughs> and be glad. For the devil has been thrown and cast out of heaven. But then he says, But woe unto you the earth, because he has come. Now, I am interested in the adjective. He has come with wrath, but the Bible adds great. Wrath is already bad. If you have wrath, you are already terrible. But then when the wrath is great, then you are very great in the terrible. No, what, what the Bible is simply saying, and I was asking myself, why is the devil to that level of aggression and of bitterness? Why is he that wrathful? And the Bible gives us the answer. Because it ends by saying, because he knows that he has but little. You know, when you know the time that you have, when you know the times you live, it gives you the impetus to become serious about your mission. It gives you the desire to accomplish the mission God gives you. And you have no time for wasting. It takes knowing the time in which you live. Paul says, we live in the last days. My passion and call is that as you begin this year, why don't you take time and ask God to be precisely clear about your desired mission, that you may give the best you can, and you may live the best you can, and live a life worthy, that when Jesus finally looks onto you, he will say the words he said, well done, my faithful." The challenge has been given to us from Kalamoja, and I'm thinking that we are going to take the challenge. Because the time is not on our side. The opportunity has come. And we must take it by the horn. Jesus said, the time is coming where the reaper and the sower will rejoice at the same. Which means that when we see an opportunity, let's take it. And I'm simply saying, Ask God, what is my explicit purpose and help me to fulfill it. May God bless you and keep you and give you a sense of urgency, a sense of involvement and a sense of purpose. Three attitudes you should avoid, two attitudes, one withdrawal and another one indifference. God has not called us to withdraw from life and society. We are not of the world, but we are in God has called us to be involved. And a Christian who is involved is a Christian that is giving God the glory. If you're a can accountant, magnify God there. If you're a soldier, <laughs> give glory to God. Can I end with this one? John is preaching the gospel. And John was a very radical preacher, by the way. John will tell you, you fools, who warned you? You, you eh? He was not like me who, who caught a BT, please. Uh -uh. John would look at you and say, you fool now, who wanted you? Who told you to come and avoid the, the axe? It is lifted, it is... A... And then the people heard this and they said, John, the Bible says in Luke chapter 3 verse 10, that the crowd came to John and said, John, you have been hard on us. But now what do you want us to do? Do you know what John said? John did not tell them withdraw from life. He said, if you have two tannics, take one. And give to one who does not. In other words, be generous. Move out and share. Be a blessing to somebody. And then as he was speaking to the crowd, in the crowd there were some other people. The Bible says the tax collectors were there listening. So they also said to John, John, now what about us? <laughs> Should we resign? Should we resign to save our souls? And John looks at them in the eyes and says, collect that which you are meant to. In other words, be as fair as the law stipulates. Be faithful. And by doing so, you are lifting up the name of him who called you. 
And then as the tax collectors are finished, they are going back. The soldiers are listening. I, I don't know what they were doing there, whether they were guarding people or whatever. But at least they were there. And the Bible says, and the soldiers ask, what about us? And the Bible says, John says to them, don't extort money from other people. Don't use your positions to manipulate others. Live as faithful as you can. That's what Jesus is saying. Live as faithful as you can at your post. Magnify God where you are and do the best you can to contribute to the expansion of the gospel. If we do that, by the grace of God, God will move mightily in our lives. And I pray that he does. May we humble ourselves and pray because we have stayed long. I, by the way, thank you for bearing with me for all this while. Just pray so the God. Okay. Uh, before Pastor prays, we were thinking that we divide ourselves in groups of three, three, so that we can pray uh, in those groups for the different prayer requests that we are having for like one minute or two, and then after the pastor will conclude it with a joint prayer. But let us just maybe you can turn and face your friend. Any prayer request that you might be having, you share it with them, and then we pray together. And then the pastor will conclude it after with a joint prayer. <laughs> 